Well, today we're in chapter 3, verse 7, as we continue our verse-by-verse study here in the, the book of 1 Peter. And as mentioned earlier, we spent some time last week looking at verses 1 through 6, and so today we'll look at verse 7. And this is a passage that deals with the Christian husband. So in verse 7, the apostle Peter writes, Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of, of life that your prayers may not be hindered. So he's writing to husbands. He's writing to the married men. I heard a woman once say that, she said this, she said, I think men who have a pierced ear are better prepared for marriage because they've experienced pain and they've bought jewelry. And so that's probably... <laughs> There's some truth to that. We're going to be looking at husbands today. And as we look at husbands, uh, here we have a portion of Scripture where the apostle gives the husband instructions concerning the treatment of his wife. Now, I would remind you, even as we begin to look at this passage, that the apostle Peter is writing to Christians. He's writing to Christian husbands. Because a non-believer isn't necessarily open to this kind of instruction. Proverbs 15, verse 12 says, A scoffer does not love one who corrects him, nor will he go to the wise. There are many people who will go to people who have had several failed relationships, perhaps more than one failed marriage. And for advice, they will go to the ones who have failed rather than to the ones who have seen God move in their life and seen their marriages flourish under His hand. Many times people want to uh, receive counsel from those whom they believe are experienced. But experience isn't always the best teacher. And so I have a tendency of wanting to speak to those who have succeeded, because in their success, they have also experienced times of trouble and struggle, but they've been able to work their, their ways through that time of struggle and trouble and have gotten to a place that, that the Lord is blessing their marriage. And so not everybody wants to receive counsel from those who have wisdom, and very often it's the scoffer who resists that. So the believer will listen to advice where the non-believer does not. Now as we begin, I'd point something out that's very basic. God designed marriage to have husbands in the leadership role. And this role finds its origin in creation and is intended to ensure order in the home. We all know that a, a body with two heads is, is really monstrous. It's really not the way things should be. And every family is to have leadership, and God has created the husband to hold that leadership role. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, the Apostle Paul said this. He said, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. He goes on in the same chapter in verses 8 and 9 to say, Man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. God created man, created woman. God intends leadership. Jesus modeled submission to proper and proper relationship with his father. Even so, we've been seeing in First Peter how the apostle has been speaking concerning the proper role of submission within the confines of, of government and in, in society at large. And he's been speaking concerning that as it relates to marriage. And so God has created man to be the leader of the home. Now, though God has intended uh, man to lead, some husbands have a difficult time doing so. Perhaps it's, it's because some wives refuse to be led because they believe themselves to be more capable. She may have been leading for a, a long time and doesn't want to relinquish her power. And that creates tension, especially when the husband believes it's time for him to take that lead. And sometimes, even in frustration, he might try to force his leadership on his wife, and it doesn't work. Some husbands really don't know how to lead. They, they weren't trained to lead properly. Some had no fathers, or they had improper leadership role models. Some husbands are simply too timid or even afraid to lead. Maybe they're afraid to fall, and they're more comfortable having their wife tell them what to do. It's like that story of those two lines in heaven. And they're all men, and so you look in the front of the line, and there's a sign, and the sign says, this is a line for all men who are bossed around by their wife. 
And as far as you could see, there's a line of men. But there's another sign that says this is the line for those who were not bossed by their wives. And there's only one man standing there. And so someone walks up and says, how come you're standing here? And the guy says, well, I don't know. My wife told me to stand here. And so <laughs> that's why I'm here. Some men just really don't know how to lead and they, fi they find it more comfortable to be told what to do. Obviously, leading the wife and leading a home isn't easy. Some men don't want to make decisions. They, they think that things are fine. Their, their attitude is, why rock the boat? Why change things? It's like that man who said he hadn't spoken to his wife in 18 months because he doesn't like to interrupt her. You know, it's one of those things that he just is just comfortable with the way that things are. But God has, God has vested in men the responsibility of leadership in the home. Now that's something that I as a husband am being held accountable for by God himself. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, Paul said, If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So I actually stand before God giving an account of the ministry responsibilities that he has given to me and my faithfulness in those things. The Apostle Peter writing here is writing from... Two, uh, two, in two ways. One, he's writing from experience. He was a married man. And secondly, he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he's beginning to give instructions to husbands. And this is what we see here in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. And that's why he says, Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them with understanding. Now, he begins by saying dwell. That word dwell means to intimately cohabit. He's saying you need to know the difference between a house and a home. I can still remember when I was around six or seven years old in a class, in our class at school, where the teacher asked the question of the students, what is the difference between a house and a home? And a little girl raised her hand, and I think it was the best answer I've ever heard, and she was just a little girl, six or seven years old. She said, a house is where people live, and a home is where a family lives. And I've never forgotten her definition because it's a good one. Men need to know the difference between dwelling in a, in a motel with domestic service and a home. And we have to be the ones who are used by the Lord to, to, to make it possible for it to actually be a home. So you, you live with this woman, but you're not just living in the same place. You're actually intimately growing to, to enjoy being with her. Notice how he says, dwell with your wives with understanding. With understanding. Now, that is a challenge. You know, it's been said there are two times when a man doesn't understand a woman, before they get married and afterwards. You know, and there's probably some truth to that. You have to actually work at getting to know one another. And the way that you get to know one another is to spend time with one another. That's how you dwell with understanding. You make her your chief interest or your the number one thing that you study in life outside of Scripture and your relationship with God. And so what we do is we dwell with our wife according to knowledge. The way that I grew to know the girl that I ultimately married is I spent a lot of time with her, and I did so first when we dated. And so when we dated, I got to know this young lady. I got to know that she was the kind of woman that I could spend the rest of my life with. I grew to love her through dating and getting to know her. We went out quite often, and and as we did, we'd spend a lot of time with her. We had things to adjust to. She didn't always like the places I went or wanted to take her. You know, I can still remember her complaining because I only spent $10 on our date. And uh, she thought I was cheap. And, and in a sense, she's, that was right. But I'd have spent more if she'd have paid more. Um, <laughs> that's all she had was $10. So that's all you get in a date with me. <laughs> But, you know, in the dating relationship, you spend time with them, you get to know them, you get to learn things about them and all. And so what Marie and I decided to do is we decided to continue dating into the marriage. We didn't stop dating just because we got married. We dated to get to know one another, continue dating, so we continue to grow in our relationship with one another. It's a very important thing to do because in dating, you grow to know them. Now, in some dating relationships, you're learning things you shouldn't know until you're married. And in some marriages, you're, you still don't know things you should have learned when you were dating. There are a lot of guys who don't yet understand that one basic thing. They want to know certain things about that woman, but they don't want to know the things that matter to her. 
So it's an important thing for us as men to take some inventory because you can actually look within yourself to discover how well you know this woman by simply answering questions uh, that would be related to her. What is her favorite color? What is her favorite meal? What is her dress size? I realize that changes every so often. What's the standard size? I don't know. De the devil told me to say that, ladies. Forgive me. <laughs> you know, things that matter to her, her, her best friend in the eighth grade. You know, uh, just the other day, just yesterday, um, Marie was on the phone. She was speaking to one of her sisters, and, and she says, No, Dad wasn't left-handed. Dad was right-handed. And Marie looks to me. She says, Was my dad left-handed or right-handed? You know, I think that's cool that she can actually ask me a question like that. And I said, no, your dad was right-handed. Yeah, that's right. My dad was right-handed, she tells her sister. You know, and her grandmother, Dominguez, was left-handed. You know, and so we've had that conversation. We know those things. Small things, yeah. You know, monumental things, absolutely not. Important things, you bet. Why? Because she can ask me things about her family. She can ask me things about whatever she wants. And because of our conversations and the volume of, of talking that we've done, I have an awful lot of information that is cataloged. Our first date, I picked Marie up at 11 o'clock in the morning and dropped her off at 1 o'clock the next morning. We spent the whole day, 13 hours with a friend. Uh, we double dated, spent some time with another couple, 13 hours together. And all we did was talk, and we still talk. That's what we do. We spend time visiting every day, all the time. Dating, yes, I have the, the, the blessing of the Lord and the luxury to be able to determine uh, my schedule so I can actually spend time with my wife every day. So Marie and I continue to date to this day, basically every day. The only day that we don't have a date is on Sunday morning because you guys are ruining my marriage. But that's the, <laughs> that's, that's the only time that we don't date. You know, it's on Sunday. Monday through Saturday, we're together. Monday through Saturday, we spend time uh, together. And that's, that's what's made our marriage very strong. And, and over the years, I, I have as a husband, as she as a wife, I as a husband have done my best to get to know this woman that I'm married to. My dad was not a talker. My dad wasn't the kind of man who would sit down with you and bend your ear in conversation. That just wasn't my dad. My dad would sit in front of a television set and talk to you during commercials. And when the commercial was over, that was it. Conversation's done. Better be finished because that was my dad. So I had three-minute sound bites with him all of my life. But I can still remember my dad speaking to me one day, saying to me, David, before there was you, there was your mother. And when you leave this home, there is still your mother. Your mother comes first. And my father taught me to put the wife in the proper place. He said, you, teach, you, you spend time with your wife, you love your wife. He didn't have to lecture me, he just showed me. And so you learn to do that by spending time with this woman. You get to know them and get to understand them. So you dwell, uh, dwell according to knowledge, the scripture says. You make her the focus of your studies. You get to know her, whether she has you know, a soft spot, whether she is you know, a kind of person who who has a great sense of humor. I learned that very early in our marital relationship. I, I learned about Marie's sense of humor. I used to have a plastic spider. It's a black widow. I've shared this before. A black widow. It looked real, and I would put it all over the house. So when Marie was making the bed, the black widow would come out from underneath the pillow when she'd lift it, and she'd scream. And I'd be in the other room, and I'd go, ha, ha. And I'd go and get it, so, oh, you know, I'd put it away. Yeah, I don't like that, don't do that. Okay. And then I put it in the freezer. So when she's pulling some meat out, it would fall out. Ah, and I, ah, you know, and I did that all the time. And then one day I decided to put it in the, the cream that she uses to remove her, her, uh, her makeup. And she had, <laughs> she had been working all afternoon into like two or three in the morning trying to hem some drapes in our front room, and she wasn't having a very good time with that. I could hear her crying to the Lord, Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. I just can't do this. Jesus, help me. And I'm laying in bed thinking, you know, 
Yeah, help her. I need to go to sleep. But no, I, I remember I could hear her. And then she said, I'm just giving up. I'm coming to bed. And then I remembered the, the spiders in the, in the cream. And I jumped out of bed, but I didn't get to the bathroom in time. I heard screams. Oh, no. I can't take this anymore. <laughs> And I hear, the, I hear the sound of this cold cream hitting a door. She threw it. Whack! You know, I walked in. There's this little spider all sad. And I picked him up and threw him away. I discovered she doesn't have a sense of humor. You'd think I learned my lesson, huh? A few years ago when I first lost my memory, Marie got really concerned about that. Because I, I had amnesia. I had no clue where I was. And it was kind of a serious situation. So I did a Sunday night service and I was driving home and I called her up and I said, I'm on my way home. Okay, honey. I said, but I'm not quite sure where I'm at. She goes, really? I said, I just, I'm on a street called Walnut. Walnut. She goes, yeah. I said, yeah, I'm going. I said, but I'm not sure if I'm coming home or if I'm going away from home. Really? I said, yeah, let me tell you the cross street. Okay, I just passed a street called Mountain. Well, that's in a different direction than I live. So she goes, you're going in the wrong direction. I said, oh, well, wait a minute, maybe. I said, there's another one called Central. You're going in the wrong direction. Oh, really? Well, you know, honey, I, this is a street called Euclid. You're going in the wrong direction. Turn around, turn around. And I'm on my way home. I'm just going home. I'm just driving home, you know. I said, okay, uh, and I start just naming streets. And, I'm coming to get you. I'm coming to get you. And I said, I'm okay. No, I'm coming. We're coming. Well, I'm driving, and I'm coming up our street, and I see her and my son Joseph just coming down towards me, and I see them as they're coming down towards me, so I slowed down. I put my hand 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock on the steering wheel, sta stared straight ahead as I went by them at 25 and a 45, and they, they're honking the horn, flashing the lights, and I can see their hands like that. <laughs> And I just drove past her like I didn't see her. <laughs> and I, I wait till I see him making a U-turn, and I sped up. And I go, I speed up into the neighborhood, and I and I turned, and, and I knew they were going to follow everywhere I'm going because they think I don't know where I'm at. I finally got home. I was laying on the couch watching TV when they walked in. She still doesn't have a sense of humor. She got so mad. What are you getting so mad about? I'm safe. I'm home. You shouldn't do that. So you learn certain things. Over time, I haven't done it since, well, I forget since the last time I did something like that. Well, we've got to learn to dwell with our wives according to knowledge. And we do learn the things that they like and the things that they don't like. So what do we do? Well, we husbands restrict outside distractions. We concentrate more on her and the things that will make the two of us into the one. Distractions can take us away from our marriage instead of building it up and therefore we're careful with the things that distract us. Hobbies and, and work, outside activities that eliminate my wife from my life should be kept at a minimum. No distractions should come before her. As a Christian husband, I want her to be blessed by the Lord. And so I, I restrict outside distractions so I can concentrate on developing a relationship with her. Because if we're going to make it to the end, we need to walk in the same direction. Amos 3.3 3 says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? And so we dwell with our wives according to knowledge. Also, notice how he instructs husbands to give honor to the wife. When he says giving honor, that's another way of saying assigning dignity to her. What we do is we maintain and provide for the wife in every way that we can. We do this by the way that we treat her, how we speak to her, and how we speak of her. We assign dignity by encouraging her walk in the Lord, and we do so by His Word. It says in Ephesians 5.26 that Jesus sanctifies and cleanses His bride by the washing of the water of the Word. So husbands, I cannot emphasize this enough. Spend time together reading devotions, reading God's Word, and actively serving together in your church fellowship. I cannot emphasize that enough. Marie and I have been together for a while now. She was 22 and I was 24 when we met. I got saved 
1970 at the very end, but had to go into the military. I spent 21 months active duty, got out of the service, went into a backslide, got right with the Lord. In September of 1973, began to teach a home Bible study. I had just turned 23 years old. I taught that Bible study for many years, but for that year, the next year, my brother, August 4th, 1974, got saved. When my brother got saved, he needed a home Bible study. I started driving from Norwalk to Ontario and began to teach him a Bible study. During the course of teaching him a Bible study, he started inviting friends. One of the friends that he invited was a young co-worker by the name of Marie. Marie came to the Bible study and within two or three weeks was saved. After she got saved, I waited for a month or two. I asked her out. So she literally has her entire Christian life been under my teaching, her entire Christian life. She used to sit literally at my feet because in the Bible study, the, the room was maybe eight feet by 10 feet. It was a very small, very small room. There were just a handful of people that would fill the room up. So Marie, in order to, to be there seated at the Bible study, just chose to sit there at the chair that I was seated at. She would sit on my right hand there and she'd lean against the chair as I gave the word. She has literally sat under my teaching since 1974. I can tell you what will make your marriage good. Keep together in the Word of God. Keep together in the Word of God. Why? Because when you're in the Word together, then you have the opportunity to see what God's will is for us together. And so make sure you get up in the morning, spend time in prayer. You don't have to go into a huge prayer, brother. You don't have to. If your wife is still in bed or is still in the house before you leave or before she leaves or whatever, take a moment. Hold hands. In Jesus' name, Father, be with us today. Be with our kids if you're a parent. God, be with us. Pick up the scripture. You can read the book of Proverbs one chapter at a time, and you can do that in a month. Find a Bible uh, book to read. I, I encourage you to read the Gospel of John together. Start with Genesis, whatever is best for you. But take some time to read. Take some time to stay in the words. Take some time to study together. Serve the Lord together. Talk about Jesus together. That's what Marie and I have done for all of these years. And that's what has helped me. Listen, I was a new believer, basically, when I started teaching. I was only, uh, I don't even know, three years old or so in the Lord when I actually began to, to study the Word of God and try and communicate it. So Marie didn't marry Pastor David. Marie married David who wanted to serve God. That's who she married. And when she married this man, over the years she's been able to grow under my ministry and together we've served and together we've grown. But if you're going to have a solid marriage, remember that the Word of God sanctifies and cleanses the wife. Now he speaks of assigning honor. That also concerns lifting her up instead of running her down. The way that you speak to your wife encourages her or diminishes her personal value. I, I believe it important to do this on a daily basis. Tell your wife how much you love her. A lot of guys don't. A lot of guys don't. It's like that old man who was married 40 years and he says, my wife wants me to tell her I love her. I told her I loved her the day we got married. How many times do I have to say it? I tell my wife, and I'm not saying this, oh, I'm so good. Some guys think that way even though that's true. Uh, no, I, 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 I don't come off that way. I hope I don't. I'm just telling you what God has given to me that has made my marriage solid. I learned it. Tell your wife every day how much you love her. You don't have to get on your knees and, oh, you are the most precious. You don't have to do that unless that's how you're so moved and then we do offer counseling. No, I, I, <laughs> all I'm saying is just tell her. Baby, I love you. Baby, I, I, that was hard for me to do. I've shared this with you again. These are all lessons I learned in the early days, and I repeat them because they were, they were benchmarks for me. There I was in an office. Marie calls me. We haven't been married more than several months. I speak to her for a moment. She says to me, okay, honey, I'll, I'll talk to you later. And I say, okay, bye. She says, tell me you love me. And I say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. No, tell me you love me. I said, you know. <laughs> she goes, I'm not hanging up unless you...
tell me you love me. And I said, what's wrong with you? And my boss, who had been married 25 years, turns to me and he says, just tell her you love her or she won't hang up. That was a voice of experience. But I learned a long time ago. I learned a long time ago. It's not an insecurity on her part. It's not a weakness or a frailty on her part. It's how she's made up. She wants to know that the guy she's with loves her. So tell her you love her. Tell her every day. Use words and use actions. But let her know. I tell my wife she's beautiful. I tell her that all the time. Baby, you are gorgeous. Uh, you know, just, just two, yesterday we're driving. I'm looking at her and I'm driving. It, it's dangerous to drive with her. I have to keep my eyes on the road ahead. But I'm looking at her and I go, you know, baby, you're so beautiful. You know, I, and it's not like she's like so insecure. Oh, you got to tell me that or I, I feel like I'm a wart. No, it's not that at all. You know, it's, it's that it, she appreciates it. You know, she appreciates it. And so tell her you love her. Tell her she's beautiful. Tell her how important she is to you. Be considerate of her. Let her know because those are things that are very, very important. They really, really are. It helps to develop her dignity. It helps her to understand how important she really is. And I think we should tell them all the time. And we need to tell her how much we value her. And we should do that openly, not something that you do behind closed doors, but you do it openly. You know, I, I'll say this quickly. Um, there, are, there are men who look at me, and I know this, as being some kind of wimpy dude. You know, I understand that. You know, oh man, you know, if you were a real man, you'd know how to treat that woman, you know. They think I'm a, a wimp, you know, and, and, and I don't have a problem with that at all. I really don't. But I've got a great marriage, and I've got a great wife, and I'm very happy, and I would put my marriage up against anybody's who, who, who think that by being Mr. Macho that you're going to have a good marriage. Anybody. You know, for me, I have invested in the woman that I'm going to live with until Jesus puts me, well, until she places me in the arms of Jesus Christ. That's how it's going to be. Because one of these days, either she's going to place me in his arms when I die, or I will place her in his arms when she goes home. And I will have no regrets. I will not have this. I wish I'd have told her how much I loved her. I wish I'd have told her how, how beautiful she is. I wish I have done too many funerals. I've been to too many funerals where that husband is regretting that he didn't spend more time with the wife, that he didn't tell her how special she was. And that, and that husband's heart is broken because it's too late. Well, I made up my mind a long time ago. Uh, when, when she sees me in that casket, she will hear my voice in her mind, and she will hear these words, Marie, baby, I love you. You are beautiful, and I'm waiting for you. And that will be in her heart because I planted it there. Husbands, love your wives. Pour into them that they may know how valuable they are now because you don't want to bury them one day and wish that you had told her one last time. You see, my grandmother, my grandmother was angry at my grandfather and he went to give her goodbye kiss as he went to work. He was 50 years old. He went to kiss my grandmother and she turned her face from him and he went to work and that day on the job, he used to work in a lumber yard, and he was in an area where they did a lot of grinding of the wood and all, so there was a lot of, a lot of dust and uh, sawdust in the air. And sawdust explodes. If there's a, a, a fire, it'll explode. And it exploded with my grandfather, and he got third-degree burns over his entire body. He was placed in the hospital and he died. And my grandmother told my mom, and my mom told me that I wish I would have kissed your, your, your dad. I wish I would have kissed Grandpa Rosales goodbye because I never had a chance to do that. Listen, I'm not going to be guilty of that. I'm not going to be guilty of that. My wife is told every day how much I love her. She's told every day how important she is to me. And you need to do that 
if you're going to have a solid marriage. You need to. It's not because she's weak. It's not because she's needy. It's because she is the weaker vessel. It's because she has this gentleness of spirit. And that's how you minister most effectively. And you're not being a man when you bully her. And you're not being a man when you verbally put her down. And you're not being a man when you stand up and, and puff out your chest to show her who's boss. You're not being a man. You're losing authority. You're not gaining it. You're losing love. You're not building it when you treat her like that. The Apostle Peter would make it very clear that is not what we do if we're going to have a good wife and a good marriage. She is, as I just said, the weaker vessel. She's the weaker vessel not because she's physically weaker. I mean, you can go to a gym and you can walk into the gym. There are some huge weightlifters in there, man. Have you seen them lately? And they're curling and they got these 22-inch biceps and veins that are popping out of their arms. I walk in and I say, those women are the biggest women I've ever seen in my life. And the tattooed dad on their shoulder. I mean, these are scary women. I mean, he's not talking about, he's not talking about physical weakness at all. What he's speaking about is her gentleness. So you don't treat her wrong. You don't abuse her. You're not mean to her. I had to learn that again. You know, part of the lessons God has taught me is what I've succeeded in. It is when I've had to learn through my failures. But I try to learn my lessons as quickly as is possible. I come from a family that I had permission, and, and I'm aggressively disobedient, I confess. So I would say what's on my mind, regardless of whether it was appreciated or not. But my mom and my dad, as long as I spoke what was true with respect, my mom and my dad were fine with that. So I would say what's on my mind, which is one of the reasons why bringing my parents to Christ was not that great a challenge. I just, in terms of sharing with them, it was a work of God's Spirit to bring them to faith, but in terms of me speaking to them, I didn't have a problem with that at all because I, I was raised in an environment where I was given permission to speak. And so I would speak what's on my mind. And it would always be kind of a soundbite thing. It was just this is what I think, this is how I feel. Marie and I get married. She comes from a very quiet family where they kind of like think things through and consider things. And I wasn't anything like that. And so we have a disagreement. And, and the way I, would handle, I handled it was like, this is what I think. This is the way it's going to be. You got something to say? Say it now. And that was just Rosales. I mean, that's what Rosaleses do. You got something to say? Say it now. She wouldn't say anything. So I figured, end of story. It's done. No problem. And I'd leave. I did this a few times. I'd walk outside. I'd come back an hour later, and she'd say, listen, mister, I want to tell you this. And I'd look at her, and I'd say, hey, I thought we already had this conversation. You had your conversation. Mine's just starting. <laughs> and I'd go, What? You know, like, what's that all about? I, 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 I don't get this. Because I've already dealt with it. I thought we had an agreement. I said it. You agreed. You didn't say anything. It's settled, right? Nope. Nope. And so I had to learn a long time ago. I, I can still be direct, but she also knows that. But I had to learn a long time ago that you don't, you don't, you don't just intimidate. You don't just use your verbal. I mean, that's what I do for a living. I speak for a living. So I'm used to it. I'm used to studying. I'm, looking, I'm used to looking at points and subpoints and developing how to respond to that. I'm used to that. I have a debate mentality. And so when I get into a discussion, I've already got it thought out normally. So obviously you have to understand I'm right. And that's the arrogance that God had to deal with. And I didn't even realize it. You mean there are two sides to every story? Duh. Yes. And so I had to learn that. I had to learn to be quiet, to let her speak and not to bully her and intimidate her. Marie is more deliberate in the way she thinks, more deliberate in the way that she presents things. For me, I'm very quick. I just say this, 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 that's it. For Marie, she says, well, there are variations, there are shades, there, and I had to learn to do that with her, and I learned how to do that over time. Don't bully her. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. It's an attitude of sacrifice. So learn to cherish and be tender towards her. Years ago, Marie and I were going to 
the hospital. She was about to give birth to David, my son. And we went to Pomona Valley Hospital, and as we were about to walk, we walked up the curb, and we're walking towards the entrance. A woman was being wheeled out, and she was she had just given birth. She was holding her three-day-old infant in her arms. And as they wheeled her out to the curb, her boyfriend, her husband, pulls up on a Harley. Yeah, on a Harley. And she climbs out of the wheelchair, and she climbs on the back of this Harley with her infant and drives away. The nurse turns and looks at Marie and me with this look of disgust, like, can you believe what this guy just did? And I looked back at the woman, and I thought, I have to apologize for all human beings, all males on the face of the earth, for what this guy just did. Because that, to me, was so amazingly stupid. And I will use the word stupid, forgive me. To us in my house, that was a word that you shouldn't use. That is what that was. And I could not believe it. You see, when Marie gave birth to Corinne, because she gave birth, she had, you know, 33 hours of labor, then she gives birth to this baby, it was, it was tough for her. And so we lived in a small apartment in Roland Heights, and, and I literally carried her up the stairs and carried her down the stairs for two weeks because she, she was healing up. Now she carries me up the stairs and carries me down. But at that time, I used to carry her. And I would carry her up the stairs because she was healing. And it took her no less than two weeks. And so this woman just gave birth, and she's on the back of a hardtail Harley. Unbelievable. But there are men who don't have the common sense that God gave them at birth. They just don't think. If you love your wife, you make her her life easier, not harder, less pain, not more. And that's how husbands treat the wives. And that's basically what he's saying. We value her. We regard her. We treat her like a lady. We treat her as if she's the most important person in our life. We, we treat her tenderly. We treat her lovingly. Ephesians 5, 28 and 29 says, Husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. Yelling and demanding isn't the way to lead a wife. Bullying and demeaning destroys her, breaks her spirit. Reckless words, according to Proverbs 12, 18, pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. So we realize that we are one. We're a team. We stand together or fall together. We are called equally to enjoy the Lord, enter His glory together. And as such, I have an awareness that my wife reveals much about me. Your wife, husband, is the greatest reflection and open expression of your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. When I have interviewed men to become on position of staff here, I want to see their wife because she is his most obvious ministry. Not what he can bring with his eloquence or his service, but what is his wife like? Because according to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7, the woman is the glory of the man. It can seem self-serving, forgive me. People who know of our ministry know that the pastor of the church loves his wife. Everybody knows that. I'm very well known, to be honest with you, for that one thing. I go places where I'm speaking as a guest and people will walk up to me and will say, I listen to you on the radio, say hi to Marie. Because I mention her and I don't even think about it. I just do. I don't have in my notes, mention Marie here. I just do out of the abundance of my heart. So I don't even think about that. Anybody who's ever met Marie, forgive me if this sounds bragging, but I will brag on her for a moment. Anybody who's ever met Marie w will say she's a very, very sweet lady and very loving, and indeed she is. She is. 
Absolutely. But I've shared this with you before, how that when Marie and I were first dating, Marie wasn't like that openly. She's very closed. See, I was a Jesus freak. Jesus freaks hug everybody. Jesus freaks will say, love you, man. That's what we did. And we sincerely did. Marie came from a more rigid, traditional background. She's more reserved. And so when we were dating, something happened. She had hurt. She got hurt emotionally over something. And I was there when she began to cry. And I, I went up to her to hug her, to comfort her. And she pushed me. She pushed me away. She said, don't touch me. I don't like it when people touch me when I'm upset. And I looked at her, and I said, I really don't care. And I grabbed her again, and I pulled her to myself, and I said, you need to be comforted, and I'm going to hold you until you are, in a nice way. <laughs> and, I, and I actually, and I told her, I said, let me tell you something. Christians love one another. And what I'm doing is expressing my concern for you. And I'm not going to have you stop me from being expressive about my love. People in this church think I'm the reserved one. You're wrong. My wife is. But if you meet my wife, you would say she's a loving woman. Where do you think she got that from? The husband has that influence in the life of the wife. The woman is the glory of the man. I, in the Lord Jesus Christ, if this is not a boast, forgive me if it sounds that way, have had that influence in her. You're going to love. You're going to learn to trust. You're going to be that way because that's what we're going to be together. We're going to love. That's how it works. So you may think, oh, Pastor David, so reserved. I'm the hugger in the family. I'm the one who kisses in the family. Marie learned that through me. My kids are all that way. They learned that through their dad. My grandchildren are all that way. They learned that through their grandfather and grandma. But where did grandma learn that? She learned that through her boyfriend, who became her husband, who all of these years have cherished and loved her and shown her what love is. That's how it works. Finally, husbands. In marriage, who is the most important man in your wife's life? The obvious answer would be Jesus Christ. Yes, that's a given. Many, well, a few years ago, not many years, a few years ago now, about three or four years ago, I had a memory lapse that was very severe. It's been a few years now. And the doctors were concerned at that time to the degree that they didn't know whether or not I would ever fully recover and believed there was a potential for me to one day completely lose my memory. We were going through all kinds of tests. And I didn't share it with the church. I didn't share it with anybody except for Marie and some very dear and close friends. They were praying for us. I didn't want to bring the word to the church because I didn't want to cause my church to be concerned about me. But it wasn't good at one point. It was actually very concerning to the degree that I had to make an announcement to my family. And so after a third service, I told my kids to come into my office immediately after service so I could speak to them. They came and sat in my office with me because they knew that I'd gone through a battery of tests. And we began to speak. And I said, I'm not concerned about myself. Please don't think that I am because I'm not. The Lord's in control. But should, but should I? lose my memory because the doctor was concerned that I was, well, by the time I was 64, I was supposed to completely lose all of my memory. And I was going to probably have to be placed someplace. 
That's what the doctor was saying. So I said, I'm not concerned about myself. I'm concerned for your mother. I'm concerned that she's cared for. You see, when my dad died, he had a heart attack that he eventually succumbed to and went home to be with Jesus. When my dad died, his final prayer, my mom said to me, was this. She said, do you know when daddy had his heart attack? Do you know what he, he did? And I said, what, mama? He prayed. I said, well, of course. She said, do you know what he prayed? I said, no. What? He prayed, Jesus, take care of my wife. That was my dad's last prayer. Jesus, take care of my wife. I learned to love a woman by watching a man love my mother. Now I'm in that situation myself. And I'm in my office. And I tell my children, I'm not concerned for me. I'm concerned for mama. That's who I'm concerned for. And then I said this, and this will be misunderstood by some, I know. I hope you, I hope you don't misunderstand this. But I said this, I said, in your mother's life, there's only one great man, and that's me. I am the greatest man your mother has ever known and will ever know. My kids looked at me kind of like surprised that I would say that. It wasn't that they opposed the idea because they love their dad. It was just a surprise because I've never said anything like that. I said, that's something you need to understand about our relationship. There is nobody else for her. There is no other man greater than me. There is nobody else she will ever love. It is me, and that's why I'm concerned for her. Take care of your mother. It was a very emotional moment. Now, within three weeks, we got a call from the doctor who had said that my memory was gone, and he said, you know, sometimes we make mistakes, and we made a mistake with you. You're fine. Your memory's not going anywhere. You're okay. But at that time, we didn't know that. And I'm fine and have been fine now for the last several years, I think. I don't remember, but I'm pretty sure. <laughs> but my final thought, my brothers, fellow husbands, can your wife say that about you? And I don't say that like, mine can say that about me, you're nothing. No, what I'm saying is, can your wife, if, if your wife and I had a conversation and I said to her, who is the greatest man in your life outside of Jesus Christ? Would your name instantly come upon her lips and she'd say, my honey, I love him, he is the greatest. If not, make it your aim make it your aim that that's what she will say. Because I said earlier, one of these days, my wife is going to put me into the arms of Jesus Christ. And when she stands up and she eulogizes her husband, she will not have to lie. She will tell the truth. She will say, I was loved. She will say, he called me beautiful every day. She will say, my husband laid his life down for me. She will say, he was my hero. He was the greatest man I ever knew outside of Jesus Christ. That has been my aim, and that will be my aim until Jesus Christ calls me home. May it be the same for you.